All right. Good morning, bio curators and otherwise. So uh, I'm going to talk about KG IDG um, and the IDG in in the KG IDG stands for Illuminating the Druggable Genome, uh, and that's a NIH program for studying properties and functions of proteins that are currently unannotated, but with some additional focus on uh, what they considered the uh, three most commonly drug-targeted protein families, that is uh, GPCRs, uh, ion channels, and protein kinases, and that still leaves you with a uh, pretty expansive group of proteins to, to look at. Uh, but it does also let you focus on some things that may be very good targets for drug repurposing. And you can find out a little bit more about that, that program at druggablegenome.net. Uh, but at least as far as I'm concerned, the, uh, the big resources that we get out of uh, what this program has done so far are, are these two on this slide. Uh, drug Central, uh, now in its most recent version, so it has a, they actually just added a whole bunch of non-human drugs and their, uh, their associated data, which is pretty neat, but uh, I'll be focusing on, on human protein and, and drug interactions uh, for the remainder of discussion of this work, uh, as well as the uh, TCRD, which is focused on those protein targets of the, the drugs listed in, in Drug Central, and that's uh, online as well. Uh, but I want to back up a second and talk about the, the KG in KGIDG, and that stands for a knowledge graph, because that's what this is. Uh, the definition of, of knowledge graph is unfortunately still a little loose. Uh, I know people like to talk about it as something a little bit more like a database or a little more like a data structure, even just kind of the underlying schema or the model of the data. Uh, I like to just define it as a heterogeneous collection of concepts or entities and their relationships. So still very general, um, but there's a, there's a reason for that, and that's because this is a very flexible kind of data structure. That's really where uh, I feel its strength is. Um, and in biology or biomedicine, that often means you're, you're combining some set of instance data of events. For example, let's say patient uh, V1 has a disease phenotype V2. That's something that we've, we've made an observation of. Uh, and then you combine that with conceptual or domain level observations, perhaps from an ontology or uh, some kind of database storing conceptual information. Uh, in this case, maybe that disease phenotype involves protein V3. So in the case of, of drugs and their protein targets, we can model it here in, in kind of a, a, a very high cartoon level way as you have drugs that have targets, uh, you have proteins that are involved in a disease or a phenotype, but then you also know things like, okay, this drug is already indicated for the treatment of this disease, uh, or perhaps it's contraindicated for the treatment of that disease, and luckily we have access to that information. But what we really want to know in a situation like this is can we predict novel interactions between those drugs, targets, and, and phenotypes when we're applying this, uh, this knowledge graph, and what do we actually learn about under-annotated proteins? Uh, but at the same time, this is a, a fair session, and we know that there's a lot of data in a graph like this that we want to make more fair and continue having it be fair. Uh, so how do we integrate these individual data sources in ways that they probably aren't already integratable? Uh, how do we keep it all updated uh, as each of those, those resources change? And how do we make it all uh, fair in, in other ways besides interoperability? Uh, how do we add other data sources and can they actually help with that goal of predicting those relationships between drugs and their, their targets? Uh, this begins to get, get a little bit more complicated when we start mixing in the other data that we, we want to complement uh, our drug and target relationships with in a knowledge graph. Uh, for drugs, that could be the uh, references to literature, it could be ATC categories. Uh, for proteins, that's things like the, the pathways that they're involved in, uh, GO categories, and even protein-protein interactions. Uh, for diseases or phenotypes, that's linking it to things like OMIM or, or Orphanet. Uh, and in fact, these are all things that are, are contained within KGIDG. Uh, so I have a, a, a more expansive list of the, the data sources here um, showing that in some cases these, uh, these data sources aren't immediately integratable. Uh, those, those top two data sources, Drug Central and um, uh, TCRD, 
uh, do release all of their data publicly, so that's fine. Uh, they do release flat files of their data, but not all of their data. They do use uh, identifiers that can be cross-referenced between these and other data sources. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not something that you can just download and cross-reference and, and merge all of these directly into a knowledge graph. Um, so there is, uh, there's some effort required that kind of uh, harkens back to that, that idea of, okay, these are, these are fair for engineers, but maybe not entirely fair for uh, other, other types of humans, uh, but maybe not uh, fair for, for machines entirely either. Luckily, we have some infrastructure that, that really helps with this. And when I say infrastructure, I talk about the, the surrounding software tools uh, that can really help with this. Uh, for us, uh, much of that is the, the BioLink model that's uh, publicly available as well. But that's one single unified data, uh, data model for uh, focused on biological data and gradually treading into uh, clinical data as well. Uh, it's, uh, the important thing here is that that model was designed with uh, property graph representation in mind. Um, so when you're representing data in the BioLink model, uh, it, it does in fact make it a lot easier to represent as a, a knowledge graph and it gives you recommended uh, sources of, of ontologies to map to and predicate types that would be uh, appropriate for uh, containing within a knowledge graph. Um, we also have this platform uh, we call KG Hub uh, that in one way is a, a set of design patterns for assembling uh, knowledge graphs, uh, but in another is also all the, the surrounding tools and uh, the, the entire setup from data ingest to merging all that data into uh, a single graph. Uh, and this is based on the, the KGX graph assembly tool, which is also uh, publicly available. Uh, but what you, what you get with using K, uh, KG Hub is a, a graph project that you can produce multiple versions of, uh, but also that are compatible with other graphs that have also been produced using the KG Hub platform. So those could be uh, ontologies from the Oboe Foundry, those could be uh, other graphs even for completely different domains of uh, biology or medicine, uh, and you can in fact mix and match some of the, the pieces of other uh, knowledge graphs and merge them together in, in new ways. Uh, we also uh, use a, a tool called Grape for graph machine learning, and I'll demonstrate some of that uh, shortly. Uh, so I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail about KG Hub because that's really one of the the, the core uh, pieces of infrastructure that that we need to uh, to ensure that knowledge graph like this this is fair. Um, one of the the core ideas here is that we uh, we have consistent um, adherence to that BioLink model. Uh, but also that, that because we are consistently uh, linking through to uh, these, these oboe ontologies and using a, a very declarative uh, tool for, for data transforms uh, called, called COSA, developed as part of the, uh, the Monarch Initiative, um, then it, it becomes really easy for, for people who aren't necessarily even familiar with the, um, the entire data processing pipeline to jump in and say, oh, okay, here's what your data sources are, here's how you're transforming them, uh, and I can see how you get to the, the final graph. That's, that's one of our goals, is to make that a very transparent process. Uh, so our goal in the end is to get a, uh, a merged knowledge graph of, of all those, those sources, but also a merged knowledge graph where you can trace it back to the original raw data you can trace it back to the, the transformed data and even reuse it in a new graph if need be. Uh, you get a uh, full set of graph statistics down to the uh, counts of individual predicate types or entity types. Uh, you even get the, um, the, uh, the config for the automated build process. We, right now we use Jenkins to, to build most of, our, uh, most of our graphs in a continuous integration kind of way. Um, so if you're curious about how that uh, automated process works, well, that's publicly available as well. We're not trying to hide anything. Um, so yeah, although the code for producing KGIGG in, in particular is, uh, is on GitHub as well. Uh, just for context, this is a graph that's about 4.4 million edges and 560,000 nodes. So certainly not the, uh, the largest one that's out there, but certainly it comes down more to the, the type of data that's, that's in there than the uh, exact size of it. Uh, we also deployed a, a dashboard for this and other KG Hub graphs uh, that'll show you uh, the, that basic visual breakdown 
of uh, the, the type of predicates that we, we have in that graph, the, um, the exact type of relationships that is, uh, as well as the, the individual data sources that are contributing to the graph. So sometimes that makes it much easier to see uh, the process of, of going from data load to, to transform to, to merge. Uh, I'll take a, a quick sidebar here and talk about what we can actually learn from a, a graph like KGIDG. Um, so what we have right here is uh, TSNE plots from that grape tool. And one of the things that grape is really good at doing is producing uh, node and edge embeddings uh, of, of graphs. So that's exactly what we've done here. We've actually done a, a relatively simple uh, type of node embedding called, called line. Uh, and we've pre prepared TSNE plots of those. Uh, again, this is a, a entirely reproducible kind of, uh, kind of setup. So any, any other KG Hub graph, you can just uh, get a very similar uh, embedding and uh, visual representation of it. Um, so this is telling us things like, okay, well, mo most of our nodes are low degree. Some of our nodes are actually clustering by their, their data source. I've called that type here. Um, and we can also label their, uh, the individual ontologies or data sources that are contributing to them. Uh, we can do the same thing with the, the edges in that, that graph. Here we're showing a comparison uh, on the left between the existing edges in orange and the, the non-existing or the potential edges in blue. Uh, our expectation is that, well, most of those connections don't actually exist in the graph and probably shouldn't, but there's some subset of those that may in fact uh, be useful for predicting novel relationships. Uh, so grape is also very handy for showing things like, okay, what kind of edges may actually contribute to, to being informative for, uh, for doing this link prediction, uh, and what other types of metrics uh, may we uh, use to, to look at that. Um, so I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about the actual uh, interactions that we can, uh, we can predict. Um, it's, it's often things along this line where we have a, a particular protein. In this case, we have the uh, non-receptor tyrosine protein kinase, CSK, um, versus a particular drug here that is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Not terribly surprising. Uh, and of course, um, it's always nice to see that we have uh, interactions in our graph that, that make sense uh, biologically or pharmacologically. Uh, but some of the interactions that we find really do not have a um, a lot of literature out there. It often seems like we can uh, we can kind of leverage the the kind of the combined semantic representations that that we see within a graph to find instances. Well, eh, maybe it is actually worth following up on on some of these these older things, or at least the the graph seems to contain information that would think so. So we also have things like uh, like this protein and a um, and another uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor that it thinks may may be interesting. And there's some slightly older work. Um, that found that there may or may not be a link there, uh, or even here where we have a, uh, a GABA receptor subunit um, versus a, a particular uh, progestogen. Uh, pro progestogen? Yeah, sorry, different spelling there. Um, but what I really want to get to is, is the, the conclusions here, and the top one is that, well, we can, in fact, investigate contextualized drug versus protein interactions in a single unified merged knowledge graph. Uh, but for fairness, uh, we can ensure that the graph data and all of its precursors are publicly available. That's really our critical detail here. It's not just the final graph, not just a Neo4j representation of it, although you can certainly make that, uh, but really the, the raw data and the, the transformed uh, precursors that you can mix and match as well. Uh, there's still some limiting factors in, in this type of curation. Uh, as well, uh, namely that sources, well, they don't standardize themselves quite yet. Uh, that's always going to be a, a blocker for interoperability from the start. Um, they don't interpret themselves. Uh, these knowledge graphs don't necessarily explain why a new link should exist just yet. We're working on that. Uh, and we want some additional insight um, in the process of assembling a knowledge graph. Um, we know that assembling any knowledge graph uh, does assume the existence of some kind of unseen patterns that we can still extract from those data sources. Uh, but it does remain challenging to find truly novel relationships. That's still an area where we do require some degree of manual curation. Uh, so with that, I'll thank everyone here, uh, and I will take any questions we have time for. Thank you.
questions for Harry? It's all right. Can I, too, but. Do I go first or who is? Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. I thought, thought we, yeah. <laughs> I knew we had a, a mic somewhere around Let's here. Let's go one at a time. There we go. Of course, has a question. All right. But, but, very nice. Um, have uh, um, IDG addressed the, uh, address the option to essentially experimentally confirm some of the predictions that your knowledge graphs may, may throw up? That's what we want to do. Is, is, there, is there a process for that? Yeah, the, um, so for, for IDG, we're actually kind of in, in the minority in the, in the program in that this was just kind of like one component of a program that, to be honest, for the most part, was uh, experimental confirmation. Uh, they, this was more of a, you know, exploratory arm. Um, so within the frame of the program there, there are a lot of people uh, who are perfectly happy to follow up uh, on individual suggestions from, from the graph that might be worth follow-up. Um, I'm not aware of a, a formal process in the, in the platform uh, that exists, but at least we, we know who to talk to. Uh, and the other nice thing is that they, they have like this big um, platform called Pharos where they, they try to make a lot of this data available. Uh, so even if we don't get in contact with exactly the right people, um, the right people do have direct access to um, this type of data, or at least if we can get it on, on Pharos and in front of them. Um, and we've, yeah, we've, we've talked with the people on that, that platform uh, to have that happen as well. So yeah, yeah that's, that's certainly the goal in a lot of these instances is, yeah, how can we experimentally confirm them? So I love that question. Also, uh, brilliant talk, very granular. Uh, I appreciate the attention to definitions in this case for knowledge graphs, because I did notice the same trend, so I super appreciate that. Um, one thing that I'm curious about, so there's a database called the Comparative Toxicogenomics Database. Um, they contains more dubious or more trend-like associations with genes, but it is also very specific to you know, positive, negative, kind of almost like a fitness database. Have you contemplated maybe integrating that into the predictive uh, edge node relationship statuses or? Um? We've used CTD in, in other graphs, so it, it would be, it would require very little effort to integrate it with this one. Cause uh, like I ready just, to go. Yeah, I could never figure out how to use their data, so this might actually be productive for them? Because obviously the data is there and they have references, so it could be really productive. It's just like, where do I use it and where do I put it? This could be a really productive place for it, so I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, so, so I just have a comment. I'd be very circumspect with CTD because there's a whole load of rat toxicology data there which is essentially irreproducible. Good to know. We have time for just one more question. How bioregistry compliant are the, da <laughs> are the data sets within KG Hub? Uh, uh, they can always be better. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I know who to talk to about making them better. We can keep working on that. Yeah. Thank you again.